awesome twosome. Nothing, nothing has ever stripped your nerves as screamingly raw as the Gorgor -Gore Girls in startling color. The Gorgor -Gore Girls. The Gorgor Greetings. I've had a day filled with adventure. All of it exciting, but not all of it pleasurable. Um, <clears throat> so I'm relaxing with some gold peaks, <laughs> sweet tea. Uh, still haven't sold uh, Totoro. Totoro. Buy it, 30 bucks. So anyway, um, I'm going to give a couple shout outs real quick before I get into what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to give a shout out to Brandy Gunter, my friend, and I am going to send you a guesstimate on a couple of these items that you express interest in, in case you're watching this video. My friend Heather Iverson, I, how do I you say her last name? Iverson, Iverson, uh, who I'm sure hopefully will be watching this video. Um, thank you for the support and uh, your recent art has been wonderful and your analyses of my Twitter stream material, visual and prose has been dead on. So you're getting in the groove with the with the alchemy. Uh, so I'm just going to go and talk about this this movie here, the Gorgor -Gore Girls. <laughs> you know, it's a takeoff on the Go Go Girls that were so popular in the late '60s, uh, Go Go Boots and all that. So this is 1971. This is good old Herschel Gordon Lewis. Uh, I did try to record this video, a video review of this a few days ago, but um, I had too much, uh, I had too much on my uh, C drive, so it cut my video off. So I had to offload and delete a bunch of stuff again. So now I got room for this one, and I'm not going to keep you guys forever. But suffice to say, this is the Gorgor Girls, and it's ultimate best. Uh, now, some of you may be like this guy that I encountered on one of the groups of men who was who was shocked and offended uh, by the idea that Season of the Witch should be on Blu-ray. You know, he's one of these guys who, who wants to see the beat up, nasty, dirty, you know, film print with, you know, tons of lines and dirt specks and, and, and broken parts and, and, you know, frames missing presented on a worn out videotape that's been rented a thousand times and magnetic particles and oxidization is just like all the wiping the image away. Every time you play it, it starts to disintegrate. You know that happened when Queen recorded Bohemian Rhapsody. They recorded so many tracks on this tape, which was very limited, you know, technologically back then, all analog, and they didn't actually have all the tracks. So they kept adding those voices and stuff and as they would record onto their you know eventual master uh all of it you know as they would record more passages some of the tracks were actually disintegrating <laughs> that they were, while they were adding so they captured everything barely in time so i've always thought that was a cool story um i might be the only one Gorgo Girls, uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis. Now, Herschel, you know, invented, he invented the Gore film. Not exactly. They call him the Godfather of Gore. Sometimes Lucio Fulci gets that title. I do think Fulci kind of, you know, nudged Mr. Lewis aside and said, you know, Viva la Gore, and uh, just went, went, literally went for the jugular as often as possible, and also for eye sockets. Um, I, I am a diehard Fulci maniac. I've got to say, he's, he's my, him and Mario Bob are like neck on neck on neck for my favorite Italian horror directors. But right now we're talking about America. So, you know, there were a few claims to the first score movie. One, one legitimate one was 1960s film by uh, uh, um, Noburo Nakagwa. He did Jigoku, which means hell. Um, and basically, yeah, it's a bunch of, it's a bunch of surreal journeys into hell has a lot to do with uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, and it's not, it's kind of on a low budget. It doesn't have the production values uh, of his movies, like, Black, I think he did Black Cat Mansion, and uh, one of the Kaidan, not to be confused with Kaidan, but one of the Kaidan films, uh, Yatsuya Kaidan, you know, there's a whole bunch of these ghost, uh, Japanese ghost story films. 
And Nakagwa excelled at that subgenre. So in Jigoku, he's really all about fate and karma and punishment. So there's all kinds of people like, you know, burning in hell and there's, you know, corpses like, uh, you know, bodies like decomposing in, in uh, almost in um, time-lapse photography, which uh, George Bukhari did decades later in, in uh, Der Todd's King, uh, the, the Death King. And it looked really cool. And, I mean, it was obvious how he kind of did the effect. It wasn't so obvious back in 1960 in Japan looking at it, and you're like, wow, okay, I'm probably did it the same way. But that's what made him him and the film, film pioneers. Uh, and then, like around 63, um, At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul Away came out uh, by Jose Mojica Marins, uh, a.k.a. Coffin Joe, or his name literally translates Joseph the Grave. And... Um, his stuff was did have some gore and a lot of blood, a lot of cruelty and a lot of sadism, which was really just about unseen up to that time. And then if you look at Phil Hardy's uh, massive tome, Encyclopedia of Horror, there's been different editions. There's been the All Room edition, the Overlook edition. Regardless of which edition you, you look at, the people who brought together the thematic like thesis of that book, which they do in the beginning, and they include, of course, Phil Hardy and a lot of other writers, but foremost among them, Kim Newman. Um, and I got to say, you know, uh, their their arguments are valid. Uh, as time has gone by and we've actually been able to see a lot of the movies that they wrote about from all over the world in chronological order year by year in the horror genre. Uh, you know, they have not actually seen a lot of these movies. Um, so... Some of it was hearsay, but, you know, we're now to the point, we meaning like my generation of film writers, critics, pundits, fans, fanatics, weirdos, we're kind of at the point where we're, we're able to form our own judgment. And that's why I'm doing a show like this. I'm, you know, giving you my perspective after consuming things like the Phil Hardy book and Tim Lucas, you know what I mean? I, I needed Tim Lucas desperately in the 1990s and 2000s. I don't need Tim Lucas now. I mean, I like Tim Lucas. I love the guy. But what I'm saying is, is I, I can now, I can now form my own opinion about films, and I can now kind of comprehend um, more of the technical side of it. Uh, not as much as Tim, but uh, a lot, you know, and enough to kind of create a, a, you know, certain philosophies and certain ideas, and then I share them you know, on this channel all the time, or, you know, or, you know, to be charitable, you might be beating you over the skull, you know, with a giant cudgel, but that's kind of also what the Gorgo Girls does. Um, it, it does everything, a lot of beating and smashing and, uh, you know, gore, a lot of gore. So right before this, you know, a couple of years before this, he did the gore, uh, Wizard of Gore, which I reviewed on the very first episode of Blue Review. Wizard of Gore... Is my all-time favorite H.G. Lewis film because it has all the gore you could ask for, but also has like a surrealistic quality and existentialist quality. Uh, Herschel, you know, churned out movies that people thought were kind of disposable uh, entertainment trash, but Herschel himself was a very intelligent man, and he was he was brilliant at marketing, and he was uh, good with words. He was from the old school. He was well read. And so there's a wit, you know, and a, and a sly wit that um, might sail over the head of, of, of uh, the generations of my generation, but definitely the generations after me. Uh, however, I do know some millennials who are who've discovered HG and are like, "Damn, man, this guy's god," and I'm I'm proud of these people. So, um, this Blu-ray has two movies though. It also has um, this stuff will kill you which I think came out immediately prior to Gorgor Girls in 1971. Gorgor Girls was kind of his inadvertent swan song uh, for decades. Uh, he stopped making films altogether. He did have, I learned on this Blu-ray in the extras, he did have three other uh, tentative uh, horror titles penciled in. I can't remember what the titles were, but they were really cool, actually. But a tentative, very tentative plot idea for one of them, I think. And uh, they just never went anywhere. They never got developed, never got funding. He never finished writing them. 
for whatever reason, they didn't they didn't manifest. So the Gorgo Girls is kind of like you know his um, an elegy, a eulogy, a, 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 a summation, a coda, uh, an incredible era um, that lasted a very short time. I mentioned some of the uh, precedents for H.G. in the Gore Department. So in 1964, he exploded, you know, onto the scene with um, Blood Feast. Now, concurrently, Mario Bava in Italy was doing Blood and Black Lace, which was not really that gory, but it was, it had more of that sadism like Kaufman Joe, and, and that say that was very influential on the Jallos, and, and which the Jallos spawned the slashers. Uh, one interesting thing that's brought up in the extras of Go Girl Girls is that uh, some people believe that this was Lewis's, I don't want to say homage, his own version of a Jallo. The Jallos were kind of birthing then, but by 71, you know, Bava had done a bunch of great Jallos, and yeah, a lot of them do have that cruelty, and there's kind of like weird plot twists, and there's like a, you know, a, a detective or a, or a main guy who's kind of piecing the shit together, and a love interest, of course. Those tropes were all very firmly... Uh, ensconced uh, in, in within the Jalo genre by 1971. That's only a year after the birth of Crystal Plumage, which kind of took what Baba did and really codified it into, I would want to say formula, but it kind of was. You know, but it, that's not necessarily bad. I mean, now, as the years went by and some lesser uh, talents got a hold of it, uh, yeah, it, it was rather formulaic. But what's funny about the Gorgo Girls is, you know, he's going into it with with no budget and, and kind of naivety. So um, it seems like it's a lesser Jallo. It seems like something that might have come out in the late 70s, like Gorin, uh, Gorin, Gorin Venice, some people call it, the Jallo in Venice, uh, or, or Play Motel, you know, the really sleazy late Jallos. Um, this one's pretty sleazy, but it also leavens the trash with class. Uh, so Abraham Gentry, he's like the main character and he's this cat here, and he's like very, uh, Stephen Thrower describes him on here as, you know, he's like a posh, uh, homosexual-ish British man, because that's how Americans perceive the British, as being this kind of fussy, dandy, homosexual uh, <laughs> person. And it's that's funny. I mean, I guess back then that, that was the perception. Now, Abraham is, is portrayed as, as very heterosexual. And, and Stephen Thrower takes note of that. So he's more, he's a dandy, you know, he's, he's not really, he isn't really making fun of, of British, of gay British uh, people or pretentious, uh, you know, theater actors and such. It's just, he has that class and he has that kind of art and he has, a, carries a cane. I mean, come on, man. He wears really cool suits, but he does have a tightly curled kind of perm for the air and a big mustache. Uh, He's really one of the greatest characters in exploitation cinema. I'm just going to go ahead and make that claim. You guys can argue and say, fuck you, you're an idiot. I mean, you probably do anyway. But Abraham Gentry really stands out as uh, probably the finest protagonist in a Lewis movie. The most uh, alive, the most lively, the most three-dimensional, or very close to it. Now, um, the love interest, Nancy Weston, a reporter... You know, it's kind of the equivalent of Sherry and uh, Wizard of Gore who had her talk show for Housewives and, you know, inexplicably thought, wow, it'd be a great idea to <laughs> do this uh, Grand Guignol uh, broadcast and interview with uh, Montag in the middle of, of this, like, Betty Crocker, uh, Doris Day, what's that other lady, Donna Shore kind of thing. It's kind of like when David Bowie and Iggy Pop appeared on Dinosaur. I mean, you know, it's that culture crash that's, culture clash that is really a crash. Everything shatters, and you're like, wow, how'd this happen? It's so fucking cool and, and interesting from a sociological viewpoint, but, but aesthetically, too. And that's kind of what that setup was in Wizard of War. Like I said, Lewis is, he's sly. He's smart. And not only did he write, direct, and produce his movies, but... Uh, sometimes he had co-writers um, or script writers, though a lot of the, the other writers like uh, Alice Louise Downey, I think was her name, who uh, wrote uh, She Devils on Wheels. Well, you know, we find out years later that Downey, Miss Downey is, is also Herschel. Uh, 
the brilliant guy who does his music, you know, uh, he does music on his first couple, and then this brilliant guy, Sheldon Seymour, wrote all kinds of wild music for his movies, some very doomy horror, very effective kind of horror stuff, a lot of country stuff. He was really into the country and uh, country western and uh, blues and that style, regional style. I'll get to that in a sec. He had quite, he was from Chicago, but he had quite an affectation for the American South. But anyway, this this great composer, Sheldon Seymour, who wrote classic songs like, you know, We Are the Hellcats, Nobody Likes, Bad Bitches on Motorbikes. They don't really say bad bitches. I think it's say bad broads or something Covered that was covered by Cramps, uh, who also covered Faster Pussycat thing. If you want wild women and you, anyway, i give it your all. I love that movie and that song. But <laughs> so anyway, we found out Sheldon Seymour, who wrote all that music for Lewis's movies, was indeed also Herschel Gordon Lewis. Because he's like, I can't put my name on all the credits. Now, he did work with people like uh, Alex Ameripour, who was a cinematographer, who was a separate entity. Uh, and, and he had certain stock uh, crew members who also doubled as actors like Ray Sager, who, due to the actor intended to play the older character Montag, uh, dropped out. And Ray Sager had to be made up to look about 20 or 30 years older than he actually was and act totally different than he would normally act. He is in this stuff will kill you, too. Um, let me talk about that in the extras real quick, and then we'll circle back to Dorgo Girls, and then I will say goodnight to you, you wonderful people. Uh, this stuff will kill you is starring uh, Jeffrey Allen, I think is his name. He he played the, you know, the, um, was he like the mayor of this town, the town, uh, basically of the town of ghosts or the undead that was slaughtered in the Civil War by those evil northerners, all those bad, bastard Yankees. And, you know, he's real boisterous and talks really loud. And, you know, uh, he's like a carnival barker. He's really intensely energetic. And he really helps make 2000 Maniacs quite an experience. And <laughs> uh, he, he's in this movie, he stars, and it's almost too much Jeffrey Allen. It's just like, that boister is crazy, you know, uh, porn poem, southern humor, you know what I mean, man. He goes on like for an hour and 40 minutes, one of, one of you know, ep almost epic length for Herschel. I mean, the only other epic length movie that I can think of he did, which was a little longer than that, was A Taste of Blood, which more or less was an audition uh, for Roger Corman to enter his stable. And uh, I don't think Roger turned him down. I think Herschel decided against it um, for whatever reason. He wanted to stay independent, I guess. Um, but... Uh, not that Corman was some big mega corporation. I mean, he was an independent himself. I mean, a self-made filmmaker like Lewis. And um, so Jeffrey Allen is like, he, in this movie, The Stuff Will Kill You, he's like a, uh, a minister who has a girlfriend who's, you know, charitably, okay, I, I'll be fair, cons uh, a liberal estimate of her age is probably 30, 40 years younger than him. If we go by appearances alone, of course, people aged differently back then. That's true, you know, generations back. I mean, you know, I'm much older than I appear to be. Um, but uh, Jeffrey Allen looked about 50 to 55-year-old man of that period, and the girl with him looked about like a 20-year-old girl of that period. I mean, she looked legal, but that's about it. But, you know, they never make a plot point of this. They don't even try to exploit it. It's like they enter, they start it, and then, like, exploitation. And then it's just like you, they, they just act like a regular couple. And, and I did like that characterization a lot, as that matter-of-fact thing. It's one of the few things that I thought had anything to hold on to. There's a lot of supporting characters, and there's good guys and bad guys. And basically, you know, the, the minister, uh, Jeffrey Allen, plays, he's, he's making moonshine, essentially. And he's getting into a rowdy business, and he's ripping people off. And then people start getting murdered, uh, people in the whatever little town they're in. And, you know, it, it drags out. There's a lot of scenes of them in church, and there's a lot of music. And some of the best parts in the, of the movie are music. There's a lot of close-ups of a guy finger-picking a guitar, which that's a great shot. I mean, it goes on a little much, but the music accompanying it, it's some really good bluegrass-style music that Sheldon Seymour 
aka Herschel von Lewis wrote. And um, there's a lot of good music of that type in this movie. If you don't like country music or or hillbilly music, what was that thing Manson used to say? I don't, I don't play country music. I play hillbilly music. You know, uh, if you don't like that, then you'll hate this. So definitely don't watch Herschel's Moonshine Mountain. Now, Moonshine Mountain is so exploitative of the South and of that scene that to me it is absolutely fucking hilarious. Uh, I wish it had been here, but it's it's doubled up on another one of the Arrow uh, Lewis discs. Um, I had watched The Civil Kill You on YouTube uh, a few years ago. I, I filled out most of my Lewis's that I, that I needed to see. There's still a few, like Linda and Abilene, I think I have a copy of and I've never watched it. There's a handful that I really want to see, but not like you know, desperately. I've seen the vast majority of his films. And so I'd seen this one, and I think I was just watching it in the afternoon, like one after the other. I watched that one. I watched The Year of the Yahoo. I watched Moonshine Mountain, another one. And you're probably thinking by the end of that day, what the hell, you probably want to be off yourself. But not no, not really, because I'm from the South, so, you know, I've had to, I've had to put up with this kind, of, <laughs> this kind of this kind of Yahoo behavior my whole life around me. Um, and some of it's endearing, you know. Uh but this stuff will kill you. I guess I just wasn't completely paying attention to it. I just thought it had, it had kind of a little nice little groove, like some of his movies get into, you know, a little dull, but kind of splashes of humor. Well, it wasn't quite so simple. When I actually paid attention to the one hour and 40 minute opus, it's really drags, man. It's like it starts sucking my life force out like a parasite. And, you know, not in a malevolent way, but, you know, it, it's just it's too much. Uh, it's not offensively, it's not offensively boring. It's just like, okay, this is the idea. Is anything going to happen? So of course, you know, the big twist comes that the, these murders that I alluded to earlier uh, were perpetrated by uh, this. Oh God, I forgot the name of the damn character. He had a, he had a kind of a, a cool name, you know, a uh, catchy name. Um, Clyde. No, that wasn't it. But uh, Rufus, that wasn't it either. But he was like the Reverend's right hand man, and he he brandishes a shotgun a lot and talks a lot of shit. So that's Ray Sager playing that that character. So it turns out he's the killer, and he struggles with the minister, and the gun goes off, and you know, of course, you know, all of Ray Sager's head is like you know laying in the grass, just fragments of bone and blood and brain tissue, and and you know, then they just start talking about how, you know, sad it ended up that way and now things are okay. You know, <laughs> they're not like in a rush to call any coroners or forensics people. Um, <laughs> but, so yeah, that's a lot of violence over moonshine, but yeah, that probably happened in real life in the 30s. Um, it's weird that this was a 1971 movie and that was an issue, but, but, so I'll circle around. Herschel was fascinated by regional stuff, by the South. And there's an extra on here called Regional Bloodshed. So this one is filmmakers Joe Swanberg and Spencer Parson on Lewis's legacy as a pioneer of regional indie filmmaking. So like I said, he's from Chicago. He's one of the damn Yankees. And and uh, he came down to our neck of the woods. And he, he, he sh filmed and also uh, toured and four-walled, meaning, you know, you take the movie reels with yourself, you book a venue, you rent four walls, and you show the damn thing on the, one of them. Uh, and, and that's a long, it was a long tradition, especially in a, a, a what do they call them, a grindhouse, um, you know, uh, cinema. And uh, Herschel did a good bit of it here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and some of this is mentioned in Dave Friedman's uh, autobiography. And that was his partner in the early days and, and his producer. And, and of course, together they did the the gore, uh, the gore trilogy or the blood trilogy, blood yeah you know blood feast and uh, color me blood red and uh, two thousand maniac so you know uh, so Friedman and from what I've read and rumors I've heard it may be all a lie but uh, apparently Lewis was very fond of North Carolina the culture and. You know, just what went with it. And he, he liked hanging out in Charlotte. There wasn't much to do in Charlotte back then. So I'm sure he livened this place up a good bit. We're talking like 1964, 1965. Um, 
I'm pretty sure my good friend Tim McLean told me he saw it in the theater around that time. I wonder if Herschel was actually there. Tim, please correct me on that story. I, I'm pretty certain you said you saw it. Around, you know, in the '60s, you saw you were very, very young. I mean, he was like practically a tadpole, but he he did observe this. Um, so I could have I could have mutated his his brain uh, to where he's the, the you know film you know uh, uh, paragon of filmic knowledge he is now. And I'm not being sarcastic. He'd be modest and insult himself, you know, and play it off, but t Tim's, Tim, Tim, he's got it going on. So, um, there's another feature, author Stephen Thrower on the Gora Girls. So, I, loaded, I alluded to that earlier. Now, Stephen Thrower is one of the most prominent uh, journalists who, uh, you know, does stuff on film and podcasts and also writes and has stuff published uh, on cult movies, and he's a genius. And, you know, Stephen Thrower, I first encountered him as one of the uh, kind of transient uh, members of the uh, band Coil, you know, which revolved around Chris uh, Peter Christopherson, aka Sleazy, from Throbbing Gristle, and his partner uh, Jeff Rushton, uh, better known as John Balance, and who was from Psychic TV, and Sleazy was like Psychic TV also. The original Psychic TV fragmented. We won't get into all that, okay? But anyway, they made Coil, and toward the end of one distinct period of coil uh you know and then and i kind of lost track of them with the millennium and they went started going a lot of other directions and of course it was cut tragically short by uh john balance's death but well before that like we're talking about the mid, mid early 90s yeah late 80s early 90s stephen thrower and this other guy his name i don't remember uh, became members and helped out a lot. I don't know exactly what they played. I used to know a bit, but I've totally forgotten. Um, but anyway, so that's how I encountered him as a musician. So I was like, this guy's a cool intellectual, uh, you know, British dude, you know, musician. So he's really a cool uh, intellectual British, uh, you know, cult film um, critic. And I really like the way he talks about Herschel. You know, he, he kind of talks like basically like, yeah, this stuff is... Uh, Take, on a technical level, it's pretty, it's pretty daft. It's pretty, pretty naff. It's pretty gauche. It's just not really, um, it's dodgy, man. It's dodgy. And, but, you know, he manages to, I think, capture what I've thought for a long time and still think is that there's a charm there. There's an energy and, and yes, a sincerity and authenticity and at times almost naivety uh, in Herschel's stuff. And to me, the juxtaposition of the kind of person that I mentioned earlier Herschel was, uh, creating that kind of material for those kind of audiences, there's a, there's just, I don't know, there's a cultural, I don't want to say it's not a clash or a crash, it's, it's like a fusion that uh, creates, it created something new and, and, and interesting, you know, it was like a blueprint for certain kinds of exploitation cinema all the way up to this day, many of which don't have that charm uh that you know more modern attempts even ones by herschel himself uh have failed uh, to me uh they're very much of their time and yet you know if you go back and look at them in context of the time they were shocking as fuck for that time so they were very visionary and and to me uh they're not dated they're like a, they're like in a time machine they're like in the plastic bubble with john travolta no, I'm kidding. Uh, Thrower summed it up well, almost as well as I just did. No, no, <laughs> much better. Um, there's a little introduction to both movies on here. Uh, there's audio commentary on the Gorgo Girls with Lewis. I'm pretty sure that was ported over from the Something Weird video uh, DVD of that movie. I used to have that too. Um, but uh, by the time Lewis did these introductions, you know, he was getting very up there in the years. And he died, I think, damn, what year did he die? 2017, maybe? Help, help me out. See, I need to know this stuff. Um, there's a feature called Herschel Spills His Guts. And it says, Herschel H.G. Lewis discusses his career post Gorgo Girls and his further adventures in the world of marketing. Now, that's another thing is, outside of and Herschel, like I said, he is a great storyteller. I mean, oral storyteller. I mean, but don't get perverted. Vocal storyteller. And 
Um, he's really sharp, and he kind of talks about how there's that world, and then he stepped out of that world, the the, the world of the Gorgor girls, and 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 its ilk, and went into uh, direct sales, direct marketing, a mail order advertising, and 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 not only doing the advertising, but creating the campaigns, writing the copy. Um, because he, like he did with his movies, starting with the ones he did with Friedman, all the way to, through his solo stuff, um, he was marketing these movies. He he knew how to sell this outrageous content, and so he also knew how to sell kind of mundane and banal content. And he won awards for it. He made quite a lot of money. I think he made more money at the time than he had done made on his films. Now, if I understand correctly, up to his death, he owned a portion of his films. I know Shock Films was an endeavor that ended up owning them in the 80s. Jimmy Maslin, I think, was part of it. Those were the ones that came out on VHS, and some of them were hosted by Joe Bob Briggs. And I had I had the Wizard of War VHS tape like that. I don't know what happened with Shock Films, but I do think when the, by the time the Something Weird video DVD started coming out in the late 90s, uh, Herschel, you know, I think had a stake in it enough to where he made a good bit of money. Um, I hope so, deservedly. There are a few artists like that who have, who you know, made these kind of almost micro-budget films, and, you know, they did well, but they didn't make a profit and they were very niche. Um, but the fact that they own them years later when you get the rights and you get it on home video and other screenings, uh, you know, well, they made a fortune. Uh, uh, like Rudy Ray Moore and, and Melvin Van Peebles are two examples I can think of. I think that, I know Melvin Van Peebles made a fortune. Now, Rudy Ray Moore, I don't know if he died rich or not, but I know he, he was comfortable, you know, in the sense that he owned Dolomite, so boom, you know, that's a guaranteed uh, passive income, money coming in. He doesn't have to work to make anymore in his old age. So I think same with Lewis, but so Lewis was really brilliant in two areas. Of course, the advertising thing doesn't interest me, but I think it's interesting and fun. And, and you know, he said every once in a while I'd give a little speech at a symposium and uh, one of my books here and uh, – a guy would be like, you know, there's this weird uh, filmmaker who makes these really, really gross movies. Named, who has your exact name, Herschel Gordon Lewis? Isn't that weird? And, and Herschel said, yeah, you know, he kind of laughs it off. He doesn't exactly admit it. He kind of pokes fun a little at the guy who said it that way because it is funny because, you know, I don't think he came out and just said, are you the same guy? He's pretty much assuming they're definitely not the same guy. It's this grand coincidence of their names. So, now we're back to Gorgo Girls before we wrap up. So, Gorgo Girls is brilliant. And set, really, for what it is, it's brilliant. Set pieces are great. Uh, very violent, very ruthless, um, sadistic, but also humorous in that you have, you have that twisted vein of humor. Um, memorable things, you know, in the beginning, they smash, he smashes a woman's face repeatedly into a broken mirror. And like pops her eyes out. Like this killer is black gloved, black leather trench coat. You can't tell if it's a man or a woman. So he might have been watching some Argento. I'm just saying. And that's something Thrower um, brings up. And these other uh, other two guys who talk about his work on here on the extras. So hold on, let me exhale. All right. I'm pretty energetic right now. Uh, I get hyped talking about this stuff, and uh, I hope I hope that energy is infectious, not in infecting you in a bad way, you know, like uh, creating pustules and pus and things in your brain, but, you know, infectious as in, yeah, man, I'm with it, I'm down with it, uh, I'm picking up what you're putting down, baby, you know, so, um, and I'm kind of making one of myself, so uh, don't take everything I take seriously, and don't take everything I say as a joke, and can you discern which is which? That's the, the dilemma I encounter with interacting with other human beings. Um, but as far as set pieces, yes. So there's that one. And then there's one where he he uh, slashes a woman's throat. She's not dead, but she's bleeding. And she, you know, he does the voice thing where at first she's screaming and then she's going, yeah. 
he did that in Wizard of War. Of course, Romero did that kind of in Day of the Dead, you know, when the guy's screaming, and then as his vocal cords literally are being ripped apart as his head's being ripped off of his body, the the, the pitch of his voice is still, vibra you know, they're vibrating. And they're, 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 they're. <laughs> it's insane. Now, of course, those are consummate effects by Savini. They look real. Uh, but the, the concept that Lewis is selling here is, is incredible. Um, and uh, then he, he pushes that woman onto her dining room table and pulls her panties down and spanks her repeatedly with a meat tenderizer, which, you know, her, her, her buttocks look, end up looking like, you know, uh, uh, you know, beef gristle and uh, ground beef. Um, and, uh, and then, he, then the killer pours salt and and pepper in the wounds. Now, by this time, the woman apparently has died from her throat injury, but, you know, this killer likes to add insult to injury, add injury to injury, and insult to injury, and insult to insult. A woman hater, there's all kinds of uh, red herrings in this, just like a jallo. There's like a women's lib uh, group that comes in, comes in and uh, boycotts the strippers and the riots and uh, protests, and of course, that is, their leader is considered maybe one, and there's a, there's a bartender who's kind of nutty, like got post-traumatic stress syndrome, also played by Ray Sager, and he's smashing all these cantaloupes, he's drawing faces on them, so they're thinking, oh my god, he wants to just destroy these women. Um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of, of them, and there's you know, this clueless witless detective with a big ego who doesn't like Abraham Gentry, you know, getting in the middle of this. I mean, it really starts because Nancy Weston, the reporter, goes to Abraham Gentry, and has some kind of offer uh, for him. And, you know, it's, it's just basically kind of contrived, kind of like Cherry's interview with Montag in Wizard of War. And uh, so she becomes kind of, it shifts around, you know, first she brings him into the fold, offering him some money. And then he kind of takes over this case and uh, she kind of tags along and becomes his sidekick. But, you know, as they pointed out, I think Thrower points out in the extras, you know, she's not, with the depiction of her and, of course, the murders of the women, uh, the, the violence, and then the women's lib group uh, uh, protest, you know, yes, it's politically incorrect, it's a, of a different time, you know, it's, it's sexist, it's construed as misogynistic, but I don't, I don't believe Herschel was a misogynist. I think he loved women. I mean, and like showing women, you know, and all their all their bountiful, uh, you know, pulchritude, uh, clothed and unclothed. Um, and there's a there's a lot of humor to the Nancy character that kind of deflates a lot of it. Like she gets drunk and takes over this. Uh, there, you know, basically there's a strip off. I mean, there's a like a bake off. You know, everybody, all the amateurs uh, get on stage and try to strip and win something, and it's like a stunt. And he's doing it in conjunction with this guy named Mars, M-A-R-Z, who owns all these strip clubs. And that's who's being killed, strippers. And they all know each other in some weird kind of convoluted soap opera ways. Mars is played by Kenny Young and the comedian, probably the biggest star who ever appeared in one of that era of Herschel's films that I can think of. And uh, Nancy gets drunk and takes her clothes off. And she's always very frisky toward Abraham. Definitely wants to fuck him. It's very, yes. And a couple other women do to it. And he drolly, you know, dismisses them. But he's staring at all of their body parts. He makes them double and triple and maybe quadruple entendres to Nancy. And so they finally, you know, when the killer is discovered, of course, you know, goes splat. After, after having some more murders and one especially memorable one where... Uh, he kills the woman, and then he he snips off her nipple, and uh, milk comes out. And the killer puts it in a glass, then snips the other nipple off, and chocolate milk comes out, puts it in a different glass, and then toasts himself. Then the maid comes in, one of the rare times you see a black character in a Lewis movie. She screams, and he... They're, you know, they're simmering some french fries on the uh, stove, and he just you know, slaps her face into the French, boiling, boiling French fries until her, her whole face boils to death and, and then stirs up the blood 
retro. I mean, it's just it's so out, out out of control. Um, and the funny thing is, is when this woman happens upon that tableau, and she's like, ah, 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 and then these other women come, what's wrong, what's wrong? And you think she's going to tell her, it's two women murdered over, it's gross. But she just keeps going, ah, ah, just keeps on at top volume, you know, for like 30 seconds, and, and, and then before they cut to another scene, and it's hilarious. It's just so insane. So, yeah, it turns out to be a female killer. You know, it does go the, the bird with crystal fluid route. Um, and, and, and yes, uh, Abraham and, and Nancy get it on, but, you know, they don't want us privy to it. And so they break the fourth wall and pull down this, uh, like, a you know, a screen that you project movies on, too, and it goes black. And, and that's Herschel's, you know, what seemed to be at the time his swan song for the world of gore. Um, I just think this movie's entertaining as hell. This was a very wise investment. Um, every home should have a copy. I mean, everybody that's into deep horror, deeply into horror and gore and uh, classic horror and just, you know, bad movies, all that. So I'm going way over where I intended to end at 30. So I had some exciting announcements. Uh, I did thank a couple of friends at the beginning. I got that out of the way. The announcements, they're going to have to wait until the next episode. Thank you for watching. Um, I can't think of anything clever to say. Excelsior is, uh, you know, it's already copyrighted. I'm kidding. Uh, but anyway, rock on, my friends. Love you all.